Hello and welcome to this brief lecture which provides an overview and introduction to our study of the famous or shall we say infamous clash of civilization thesis which is used here as the platform for analysis of globalization, westernization, and power struggles on the ground. The reading of Huntington's article is coupled with a reading on McDonaldization by George Ritzer. The connection may not be intuitively clear, but one of the things I would like for you to see or think about in a critical way is the relationship between westernization and bureaucratization as perhaps synonymous with the idea of globalization. Especially after 9-11, and uh, even more so in the contemporary world of ISIS, Americans have become increasingly preoccupied or concerned about armed military conflict. Especially after World War II, the mode of armed conflict has changed dramatically with the introduction of guerrilla warfare, the involvement of uh, normal citizens, and counterinsurgency models, all of which rely on behavioral science and psychological approaches to, in quotes, winning over, in quotes, the enemy, who is often not so easily identified. So with that preface, we start with the controversial thesis of Samuel Huntington. While his basic clash of civilization thesis is somewhat dated and has largely been discredited by a number of academics, his ideas continue to be debated in political academic but especially in more general public circles. The main thesis comes from two works by Samuel Huntington. The Clash of Civilizations, an article that appeared in Foreign Affairs in 1993, and then the book, The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of the World Order, which appeared in 1996. The key thesis is that the great divisions among humankind and the dominating source of conflict will be cultural. Nation states will remain the most powerful actors in world affairs, but the principal conflicts of global politics will occur between nations and groups of nations from different civilizations. This clash of civilizations will dominate global politics, and the fault lines between civilizations will form the battle lines of the future. A civilization represents a cultural entity, and such entities exist at different levels, villages, regions, ethnic groups, nationalities, religious groups, all of which have very distinct and identifiable cultures. A civilization represents the highest cultural grouping of people and the broadest level of cultural identity people may have, it can include uh, sub-civilization. And so Huntington is arguing that the nation state will be overshadowed by these broad cultural groupings of civilizations. The concept of nation state provides a core idea both for Huntington and for his detractors. And understanding nation state is a prerequisite to understanding Huntington's argument. The famous painting by Gerard Terbosch enshrines the Treaty of Westphalia in 1658. Peace among sovereign nations requires, in other words, according to this principle, that each nation develops itself fully and regards it as its self-interest to develop the others fully and vice versa, a family of nations. Uh, never mind that the salutation to the treaty is to a uh, Christian gentleman, but in the contemporary world we think of the nation state as having a defined geographic territory, governments with sovereign power, and citizens with national identities 
including an understanding of their rights. So why will civilizations clash? And here Huntington identifies seven or eight. There are cultural and religious differences, economic differences. Huntington uses the terms first world, second world, and third world presented here. The important idea concerns the declining relevance of these categories or large world areas, first world, second world, and third world. Huntington claims these distinctions, which emerged during the Cold War, have been supplanted in importance by groupings based on culture and civilizations. His claim is that the seven or eight venerable civilizations will predominate and undergird conflict between nation states. So here is the traditional categorization of first world, second world, and third world, plus newly industrializing com uh, countries. A more contemporary mode of identifying economic differences among nations would be the World Bank classifications, which are low, medium, and high income countries, which use a number of different empirical indicators. The map identifies the, or illustrates the significant dividing line identified by Huntington, the eastern boundary of Western Christianity, which appeared in uh, the year 1500. The east of the line is Orthodox and Muslim. West of the line is the West. And so part of this is that the Cold War and the Iron Curtain perpetuated this division and divided Europe politically and ideologically such that there is now a cultural difference between Western Christianity, which is West and North of the line, and Orthodox Christianity and Islam, which is East and South of the line. Without oversimplifying, uh, one principal civilization conflict is between Islam and the West. The conflict between Islam in the West has been going on for some 1,300 years, beginning with the Prophet Muhammad up through the, uh, the decline of the Ottoman Empire, uh, the colonization of most of North Africa and the Middle East by Britain, France, and Italy. Then after World War II, as the West retreated, the colonial, uh, I love this word, disappeared, but the colonial empires um, began to fall asunder and a new kind of underlying nationalism appeared along ethnic lines that were previously masked by the colonial empires. This also saw the period of uh, Arab nationalism and Islamic fundamentalism and a Western uh, dependence on, the, on many uh, nations in the Middle East region for, uh, for oil. And then the oil-rich countries became weapons-rich, according to Huntington, and often uh, uh, weapons-rich. So the conflict, according to Huntington, was along the fault line for 1,300 years. With the retreat of colonialism, these uh, underlying nations emerged. Relationships or relations between Islamic uh, countries and the West are further complicated uh, probably even more so now than at the time that Huntington wrote by the migration to Western Europe of populations leaving Middle Eastern regions. We're seeing this now uh, in a magnified way with ISIS. But this was coupled in Europe with racism, political reactions, and then violence. Additionally, there's a great deal of antagonism. We've seen more of this since the time that Huntington wrote between uh, Islam and Christian blacks in Africa. Uh, likewise, religion was viewed or has been viewed as an amplification uh, force with the revival of ethnic identity, such as in Bosnia and Sarajevo, a Serb and Albanian. There's likewise been a revival of historic conflict between Muslim and Hindu in Asia. And thus, uh, Huntington comes to the West versus the rest, 
and what he calls or refers to as the Ken Country Syndrome or a rallying of support between like civilizations. This civilization commonality, according to Huntington, replaces political ideology and the balance of power. The West is at a peak of power in relation to other civilization and the world community euphemism gives a kind of global legitimacy to the United States interest and to uh, Western powers. Uh, again, this is a, a broad first overgeneralization of what Huntington's saying, but also on Huntington's part, a really broad sweep of generality in terms of the global picture, and especially the global picture within predominantly Islamic countries, which themselves are striped or rife with sectarianism. But a key question that's raised by Huntington, and one that uh, we will be addressing this week with the two articles, is whether or not non-Western civilizations can modernize, that is, become more modern and more affluent, more democratic, without simultaneously becoming more Western. That is, wealth, technology, weapons, skills, and machines that um, make possible economic and other kinds of development without embracing or without becoming simply Western. So the implications are non-Western civilizations will continue to attempt to acquire wealth, technology, machine, and weapons that are part of being modern. They will also attempt to reconcile this modernity with their traditional culture and values. Hence, the West will increasingly have to accommodate these non-Western modern civilizations whose power approaches that of the West, but whose values and interests differ significantly. This will require the West to develop a more profound understanding of the basic religious and philosophical assumptions underlying other civilizations and the way in which people in those civilizations see their interest. There will be no universal civilization, but instead a world of different civilizations, each of which will have to learn to coexist with others. Again, very kind of difficult, complex, uh, tightly wrapped set of ideas. The empirical evidence suggests that in fact the conflict or modern war has not involved civilizations or wars between civilizations. Rather, uh, women and men in a quantitative analysis of 484 distinct wars over the last two centuries formed the conclusion that it's the emergence of a nation-state structure that provides a context for explaining wars. Transitions from one type of political institution to another are war-prone, so that as a nation-state emerges, or as a colonial or other power, such as the Soviet Union, uh, the Soviet bloc, move away, underlying uh, minority groups and ethnic groups um, engage in conflict as a consequence. The institution of the nation-state introduces incentives for political elites to privilege members of the national majority over ethnic minorities and for minority elites to mobilize against such political discrimination. The resulting power struggles over the ethno-national character of the state may escalate into civil wars. And so on this last side, not simply a, a the more frequent critique of Huntington in terms of pointing to the sectarian strife within some of these broad civilizations, but now empirically demonstrating that, in fact, this is not the source of conflict. This has not been where conflict has taken place. Rather, conflict continues to emerge with nation states and to be a matter of nation states. I look forward to 
the next two weeks and some lively discussion.